Hey, it's Liz D'Alto, and this is the Untame the Wild Soul Woman podcast. From body image, sex, spirituality, money and relationships, to motherhood, creativity, business, communication, and desire, Untame the Wild Soul Woman is the place to come for real stories and powerful advice to help you reclaim and redefine womanhood in the 21st century. Hello, sweet treats, wild friends, and lovers of all things Untamed. Real quick before we dive into today's show, I just wanted to make sure you know where to go for all of the other extra resources that I create, not just here related to the podcast, but in general. So everything related to the Untame Yourself world exists over at untameyourself.com. You can head over there and enter your name and email anywhere on that homepage, and you will get email notifications every week when we write blog posts, which often are just deeper dives into the topics that we talk about here on the podcast. We do free video training series, online workshops. Sometimes we're collaborating on a deeper level with some of the women that we have here on the show. So if you don't want to miss out on any of those resources or any of the things coming up in the next few months that I have in the pipeline, for you, uh, one of which is going to be a free training on transparent communication, how to have a courageous conversation, and, and how to apply that to any kind of relationship in your life, which will be coming up in March or April, haven't decided yet, uh, definitely enter your name and email at untameyourself.com so you don't miss out on any of those things. Also over there, for those of you who really love the show, who really love the conversations with women, and really crave to connect with women like you, who are on a similar path to you, but in a real life setting, like to get out of your town and to connect in person and circle up with women who you really can can connect with, women who get you and will support you. I have a couple Untame Yourself weekend retreats going on in 2016, the next of which is April 29th through May 1st here in San Diego. So if that's something you're interested in, just to quickly let you know, what we really hone in on in those weekend retreats are the four main areas in life, health, wealth, relationships, and spirituality. So if you have anything that you'd like to work on, expand into, become more available and receptive for in any of those categories, check out a retreat. You can apply at untameyourself.com forward slash weekend dash retreat. And when you apply, I see all the applications. They come straight to me. If it's a good fit, I'll be in touch to schedule an interview and we'll go from there. So that was it. Just what I wanted to share with you before we get rolling today. Now for today's show. Elizabeth D'Alto here, your host for the Untamed, the Wild Soul Woman podcast. You all have been asking for more men on the show after dazzling you in the month of November or Manvember, as we affectionately refer to it. So I have gone out to find some some interesting and some incredible men to, to bring in some variety on the show, since we do talk about balancing masculine and feminine energy fairly often around here. So today our guest is Steve Sims. I met Steve through... The Archangel community, which some of you have heard me mention before, Steve is the founder of a company called Bluefish, and I'm pretty sure he just gets paid to do the coolest shit in the world. So, Steve, welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Um, the, you are just so funny. Even you open your mouth, and I just want to die laughing. It's so great. Maybe, <laughs> oh, okay. Thank may, you. <laughs> maybe just to me. But um, So the first question that I, I ask women is what do you love about being a woman so i'm going to ask you what do you love about being a man um i get to be a husband and a father oh. i think that's it how long have you been both for um i've been been with my wife since she was 16 i was 17 so forever first lady ever kissed and hopefully the last one ever um and i've got three kids 19 16 and 11. oh my god so this is great i love I always love asking parenting questions because I am not a parent and we have so many moms and dads who listen. And so as someone who's lived, I know you're from the UK and you live in Los Angeles now, yeah? Uh, yes, I do. I went the long way around. I went to Asia first and ended up here. So I've, in fact, all three of my kids hold a different passport from a different country. Oh, no, wait. So that's what I was <laughs> going to ask if there's any other places. So where in Asia did you live? Uh, I was Hong Kong, Bangkok, then Geneva, Palm Beach, and now Los Angeles. So, so you've been all over the place. This is great. So for people who um, maybe it's complain or maybe just feel super stressed about like life being hectic and complicated, you've literally spanned several continents with your family of three children. How do you do that? 
how do you breathe? Uh, you, just do, you just do it. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a case of, well, that looks pretty. Let's go there. And you just go. And I think once you do, once you do things a couple of times, I remember I was desperate to go to Hong Kong. My wife was a little bit apprehensive, to say the least. Then when we went to Bangkok, it was a little bit more adventurous. By the time we went to Geneva, we were gagging. So every time we went anywhere, it was like, wow, what next? Um, and so it, it's just... It's just something you do. That's amazing. And so how long have you been in Los Angeles now? I've been in Los Angeles for seven years. I've cool. been in the States now for 14. So, all right. I, I know I gave a very description of what you do. Can you be a little more specific and describe? I know you just, I know it's a high-end concierge for pretty much anything and anything someone could ask you for. Yeah? I get shit done and I charge a lot for it. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's basically it. Um, I'm the man you come to when... You want to go down to the Titanic. You want to knock something off your bucket list. You fancy getting married in the Vatican. Uh, you want to go up in the space. You want to get a drum lesson by Guns N' Roses. I'm the guy that, you know, you, you call up your magical best friend. You send him a big fat check and I make it happen. So I was, I was reading on your website and, and somewhere you wrote um, a bricklayer from the UK. So how yeah. do you go from being a bricklayer in the UK to being the guy to call if you want... Axel Rose to teach you how to play the guitar. Um, well, you wouldn't phone you wouldn't phone Axel for a start because he's shit at it. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, I don't I don't I've often wondered where I actually went and how yeah. I managed to get from there to here. Uh huh. And then I'm nearly fifty, and I don't know if it's because you get a bit smart or older, or you just drink too much when you're older. But I don't think I actually ever changed. I think just the arena I played in became different. Yeah. See, I was the Irish lad uh, from East London that never had a pot to piss in. Uh, my family owned a construction firm. I had nothing, therefore I had nothing to lose, yet I also had everything. I had my family, I had my mum, my dad, my cousins. So at that time, I didn't know what wealth was until I got older and realised that wealth is your family. And if you can keep the lights on, your kids are fed, you're safe, your wife's credit card never gets bounced when it's down at the grocery store, you're wealthy, simple as that. Anything else is just icing. Um, and I didn't realize it then, but I went out searching and I was the constant why kid. And I, I've grown and I've taught people in my, in my, my podcast and in my, my consulting gigs and speeches that um, as a three-year-old and a four-year-old, I was going, why, why, why? You know, I want a lollipop. You can't have one. Why, why? I want to go in there. You can't. Why, why? I was that kid. In my 40s, I'm still the why. I want, I want to be able to go into the Vatican. Oh, you can't do that. Why? You know, I want to have uh, Matt Sorum teach me to play drums. Oh, you can't do it. Why can't you have that? Why can't I have Michael Schumacher teach me to drive a car? Why can't I go into the White House for a cup of coffee? Why? And you ask why enough, and a strange thing happens 90% of the time. If you do it with a smirk and a smile and a bit of passion, you actually get a, oh, okay then. And uh, that's that's usually how I've managed to wear the doors down. I like this. You, have you ever heard of that book, the Simon Sinek book, Start With Why? His is like the why <laughs> behind you do what you do. Yours is like the, no, seriously, I mean it. Just like freaking ask people why over and over and over again. Oh, yeah. And the good thing is, as you've, it's the constant stretch of kind of, uh, it's only impossible until you do it. That's um, right, that's right. And so when you achieve your first cool thing, We've well, already done that, so that's that's a habit, you know. And so, what's the next thing you do? You step up your game. Far too many people settle. Yeah. Um, I just want to settle for the extraordinary. Yeah. So I want the next thing to just get me aroused and, and just get me a real hard on. If it doesn't, I don't want to do it. So once I've done something, well, that was great. Then now, what can I do that's going to excite the pants off me? What can I do that's going to make me not want to sleep at night because I want to be thinking about that so much? And if that's not it, then I won't do it. Um, and so the good thing is, as you've done one thing, you go to someone and say, hey, I would like you to close down your museum because I want to throw a dinner party in there at midnight. And they just go, uh, excuse me, sir, we don't do this. Well, actually, let's rephrase that. You haven't done it. This is what I want to tell you I did last week or the last month and how this will become the most amazing thing I have ever done to date. And, of course, a month later, that's the last thing you did, and that's the example you used for the next thing. So it's a climbing block of uh, credibility. So as the years have gone on, I've been doing this for 20 years now, 
Um, no one's ever employed me because of my startling good looks, although they should. Um, <laughs> they, they employ me because I get it done. And uh, I've kind of got a good history behind me that if I say I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. So I'm so curious. Do you remember what was the first thing that like blew your mind to that next level of possibility? The first thing. Or, or the first thing that you can remember that you were like, oh, crap, like I could keep doing this. Well, actually, that's okay. So there's two questions there. The first thing, you need to know a little bit about my history. As a builder and as a construction worker, I didn't want to be getting dirty every day on a building site. So I had such a gusto and desire to get off that building site and to just stay bloody clean for the day. Yeah. That's what I wanted. And it was of the 80s. So it was all the Wall Street movie and everyone driving around in red Porsches and, and uh, mobile phones the size of a briefcase. It was the briefcase, actually, if you remember those. Yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. Case. I remember seeing those guys in London and just thinking, that's who I want to be. That's cool. That's what I want. So I wanted to get out of it. So I actually talked my way into getting a job. And a friend of mine worked in a banking company in London. And there was this big trend that in Asia – Everyone wanted British stockbrokers because we were all trustworthy because we were British because the British have never done anything dodgy in their life ever. By the way, something I've always envied about British people, you all, simply because of the way you sound, can get away with saying things that other people can't just because it sounds way cooler when you say it. Not, <laughs> It's just not fair. Someone said to me the other day, they said, the trouble with you British accents is you sound smarter than us. I said, no, it's because we are smarter than you. But, uh, um, yeah, we can. Well, I suppose we can. Um, but there was this there was this trend in Asia that they wanted British stockbrokers. Yeah, yeah. I blagged my way into this room and uh, sat there wearing my dad's suit, looking like an idiot, not knowing anything that they were going on about. <laughs> and then at the end of this meeting, when they were going on about, well, you know, we'll be doing orientation on this day and we'll be flying into and we'll be doing this. But they were talking about all this. I walked up to one of the ladies within the room who had the, the, the clipboard and I went, look, I want to make sure you've got my right mailing address for these tickets. And she said, well, what's your name? And I said, Steve Sims. She's like, oh, I'm sorry. I can't see your name. And I'm like, you can't. I'm, I'm not going to get annoyed. But so I blagged my way in. So she took my address. They sent me a ticket to Hong Kong. So I, I flew <laughs> and my wife was like, go for it. Go for it. Now, I don't know if she was trying to get rid of me or, you know, supporting me i want to think supporting me but i think she was trying to get out early um and so i went i landed on the saturday and i was fired on the tuesday so <laughs> it was hilarious. i'm so impressed what, that it took them two days to realize you had no idea what you were well, doing no, because sunday i was just getting myself set up in the apartment so the first <laughs> time i met him was on the monday i think by monday lunchtime they'd probably realized that i'd blagged my way in <laughs> and uh, it was kind of funny but i actually so this is where to answer to answer the question, I started working on the door. Um, you know, being big and ugly, it was a natural thing for me to do. So I started working on the door of these clubs in, in Wan Chai in Hong Kong. And um, I thought to myself, because I saw a lot of expatriates, I thought if I can throw parties and just invite rich people, then I can go back to the bank and go, hey, I know rich people, give me a job. <laughs> that was the entirety of my plan, okay? So you remember Pinky Simple and, and br brilliant. Uh, brilliant, I thought. So I used to, uh, I started throwing these parties and I would only invite rich people and then in the local magazines it would always be, you know, the expat community welcomes Billy who's now the head of Puma. I'd send him a welcome note and then send him a fax inviting him to the party on Friday. So uh, I started throwing these parties and my mindset was on, okay, get the, get the people's names, get the contact details, the fax number, because we didn't have emails in the 80s. That's you know, get the fax number, get the phone number, get the name, and then go to the bank. So then I would go to the bank, literally with like a pad, with all of these people I knew, and saying, well, you know, it's going well, and we're doing these events. And the banks, realizing I was a twat, they would just sponsor some of these parties so their name could be on it, but they never hired me. Right. And it was a revelation because then people in the in the parties, and I got a name for myself at these parties, they would go, oh, we're going to Monaco. Do you know anyone in Monaco? And I'd be like, sure I do. You know, I'll get it sorted. Then I'd go back home and try and work out where the hell Monaco was. <sighs> so it, in the early stages, it was a constant blag. 
And so I think probably about five to six years into it, and now I'm living in Switzerland, my wife actually came in one day and she went, look, you throw like a party a month or you do something for a client, yet every day you get up, you take your earrings out, you put a suit on and you go and hang out in basically the coffee shop of a bank, hoping that they're going to give you the golden ticket. Yet you work two days a week and you make this amount of money. The bank occasionally sponsors you and you make this amount of money. And like one was this and the other one was that. So we then thought, shall we see if we can do this? And we just stopped going into the bank one day and we just sent out faxes going, look, you've known me for doing this, this and this. But hey, you can ask it. I'll do it. And that was it. You know, that was the entirety. You can ask it. I can do it. And um, people started kind of like baiting me with a few things. And as soon as it started happening, people were like, oh, can you throw a party in Stad for Polo? Cartier going to sponsor you. No problem. Of course, then you've got all Cartier's clients. And then, you know, Ferrari want to take you on because you've done show part and Cartier parties. And then you've got Ferrari's clients. And then, you know, you've got some wealthy prince in Dubai that wants to throw a massive party and have Beyonce come in. So all of a sudden you've got their clients. So it just grew. And the greater and grander things I did, People would go, I don't believe you can do that. And then they would look at me and they go, I don't believe you did it. And that's even a greater mind. mind you can say it. You can say it. <laughs> well, it's just a mind fuck beyond belief. So the good thing is I would go into somewhere. And you've met me. Black T-shirt and jeans forever. Yeah, die, yeah. Die. The uniform. Yeah, oh, that's my uniform. Got loads of black T-shirts, loads of jeans. Never got to think about it. So... You know, every time I turn up, they see me, bald head, piercings, tats, nine times out of ten on one of these bikes. And uh, they just go, did you do that? And I go, yeah. And it's almost like a, 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 this pause. And then they go, okay, then. And they, do, they don't have any. I think if I turned up in, I don't know, a flash car and uh, a suit and can I come and I go, yes, hi, my name is, uh, you know, Stephen Cuthbert Smythe. You know, they're just, they turn off. But I think because I'm just that um, program reset on that's what right, they think they right. were expecting, kind of opens up minds a little bit more and imagination. Of course, when they look at the things that I have done, um, they just, they can accept it now. I love this so much because, you know, a, a big energy in my life is like that rebel energy. It's like I love, I always... It's like when someone tells you you can't do something, that's like exactly why I'm going to do it, as long as I want to, right? It's That's a gauntlet, isn't it? <laughs> my, my wife knows that by now, and I know she's playing it. And 50 years later, she'll, she'll be like, well, you couldn't get that room in that hotel. And I'll be like, Pfft. and then you go and do it. And you know for well you've been played, but, you know, we, we, are those, we are those rats that run for the cheese. Oh, my God. It's so great. So... God, after 20 years of just doing greater and greater, greater things, what is something that would even excite you now? Or like what still feels impossible or like you haven't tried yet? Is there anything? God, there's like 20 different questions there. I know. Um, Answer whichever one you want. All right. Um, I am an incredibly dull person. That's something you need to be aware of. I live vicariously through my clients, but I ride motorbikes. I tried to fix them and it goes wrong. Um, I barbecue very, very good chicken and crap everything else. So I just, I'm just a very, very quiet, dull homeboy. Um, but my drug of choice is passion, and nothing's impossible. I can get, I can get anything. I can do absolutely anything. There is nothing I couldn't do. And I have that Irish, uh, Irish mentality that. You know, you don't even have to point me in the right direction. I can get through it. Whether there's a door there, door there or not, I'm going through. Um, so I've always had that attitude. And, of course, when you've done the kind of things I have that you know about, um, you kind of believe your own shit. So you're just kind of like you're able to walk in there and go, we're going to make this happen. Now, hell, we've got to do it. You know, so you have that. But we have a saying, and I think I have it somewhere in my, in my wall in my office. Uh, if there's no passion, there's no point. Now, the beautiful thing is that people come to me with that dream. And when I'm speaking to them, I go, well, why do you want to do that? Mm. Oh, you know, just because. Really? Why is it because? Well, you know, when I was younger, I used to do it. And you start to get a revelation of that person. And if you can hit that hot button, then they just, it just vomits out this passion. And if you walk up to, say, four people, and you say to four people, or just, just one person, walk up to your buddy and go, how much money's in your bank account? Okay? They will get nervous. 
Because people are always nervous about telling you how much money they got because they, they lie. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And it goes up and it goes down. The bottom line of it is it's a, it's a number. It's a fact. At this time in the day, I have X, Y, Z in my bank account. By the end of the day, it'd be less. Hopefully by tomorrow, it'd be more. But that's a stark cold fact. But they feel concerned about revealing that number. You ask someone, what is your dream? And they go, oh, you know, I'd like a parachute with an Navy SEALs. You know, they'll come out with something very blasé. And you can almost see it. They will glaze over. They won't make eye contact. The arms will start flailing around. You go, <laughs> well, why is that important to you? Well, you know, I just always uh, fancied it. You keep drilling with that why, and you will suddenly find out that they want to play guitar with, say, Sting, because that was the music that their mum put them to bed with or something. Mm. And all of a sudden, you're getting into them. You're seeing them. The watch, the car, the big house, that's all fallen by the wayside. You've now just got the naked them, and they are open and vulnerable. And you go, do you know, we're going to make that happen. And they get so excited. And when you're watching someone, I've done some stuff which has absolutely no interest to me whatsoever, but it's been their dream, and so I've been aroused through the entirety of it because you can just watch this person. And they say negativity attracts negativity. You find someone that just has an incredible amount of passion for something, and people will want to gravitate around that because people want that passion. Everyone wants passion from the first kiss, from being able to achieve that first goal. You want that adrenaline. You want that passion. And that, that's what I go for. So the next thing that excites me could be someone wanting to go to a bloody flower show. It could be someone wanting to go to a fashion week. It could be someone wanting to be James Bond for the weekend, have a walk-on part on a movie, just have a cooking lesson by Wolfgang Puck. But if they're aroused by it, so am I. That's cool. So it's not so much about what your interests are, your preferences, or what you want to do. It's like literally getting to that that core down deep in someone and going, all right, let's do that. Yeah, that's great. There's no, and there's nothing better than than just as there's nothing better than as they hit that moment, and you may have this 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 fifty year old CEO of a Fortune one hundred billionaire client turn around and he's got tears in his eyes and he's looking at you and he can't speak and there's just that moment that you two shared that dream that he had and there's you can't beat that you can't better and it hasn't got to be expensive people always go on about well yeah you you had andrea bocelli sing at the feet of michelangelo's david yeah that cost a lot of money but then i've also done picnics in the park where we got um a boom box and recreated the first picnic that they ever had and it's the thought, it's the attention to detail that really takes that from something to a memory. I love this so much. So one of the things we talk about through various contexts on the show often is uniqueness, right? Like someone that might sound corny to someone, someone else might be like melting going, oh, that's the sweetest thing I've ever heard. Or, you know, so you might say Vatican and someone's like, oh, Christianity. And somebody else is like, oh, that's amazing to be there. So, so to see across all the different types of people, all the different types of experiences, but the thread that you love to pull is that, that specific kind of passion. It's super interesting because I know so many entrepreneurs and people usually talk about passion in the sense of what they want to do or like their work in the world. You're kind of like blowing my mind open for the moment to like those, those experiences, like those felt like deep, like heart connection experiences that I bet a lot of people, even your line of questioning, having to go, why, 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 why? People don't let themselves have that. They don't because quite, and I don't want to get on, I don't want to get on the old uh, education soapbox here. You but can, you can. We, I love soapboxes. Go we're for it. One, we're, we're wonderful geniuses up until about the age of three and four when the teachers start beating the shit out of us and telling us that you yeah. have to color within the box. You yep. can't tell... You can't tell that kid that he's fat. You can't laugh at that kid because he walks funny. All of a sudden, we're taught to dilute what we feel and hold it in. And that's the, that's the start of the cancer in us uh, that stops us being us. Bottom line of it is, if that kid's fat, they're fat. If that person's got a funny hairdo, you've got a funny hairdo. If I'm bald, overweight, and can't speak properly, that's me. So I would love it if one day people just did not have any of those 
concerns about being politically correct, called it as they see it. And I think you get down to the root of a lot more people when they do so. So what I do as a 48-year-old people, as a person, uh, sorry, 49, God, I made myself younger. Um, I piss people off by being me, which strangely and shockingly enough is very easy because I'm not trying to be anyone else. So I can be me all fucking day and it doesn't matter. But I, I attract those people that want things done and they don't want the bullshit and baloney that goes with a, with a fluffy suit or business card. And so I think we have all of this intelligence. And I'm not intelligent. I'm not smart in any way, shape, or form. I go through the door like one of my bulldogs. Uh, but I do it while they're thinking about it. So if everyone's just stopped thinking about it a bit more and just did it, I think we'd get 10 steps further. Well, and, and you said in that sentence, you used two different words, smart and intelligent. And I think there's a difference. Like... And yeah. to, to go to the education system like you were talking about, I saw Gary V speak at a conference back in October and he was like, you know, Gary V is always cursing left to right. He's like, our kids in this education system are fucked. He's like, they're sitting in school trying to memorize things when they don't need to because everything he pulls out his phone. He's like, they could look up anything on this. Why are we making them like memorize things when they could just access and then spend time? doing other things. So, um, and this is what I love. So one of the reasons why I'm inviting men on the show, we talk a lot about, you know, this is a, a woman oriented show to empower women, but you can't exclude men from that conversation. Right. And we're seeing a lot, which I love dem to seeing like super demonstrated for the women here. One of my favorite things about masculine energy, which is that forward moving, like get it done, like make it happen. And you just said this thing, like, while they're thinking about it, I'm doing it. So for anyone listening, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, just just take more steps. So I'm curious, you you step out into the world to do all these bold things all the time. Very often, it sounds like the answer is yes, and you always find a way. Does anyone ever say no to you? Well, they can only say no to me if I ask them a question that the answer can be no. <laughs> so never, never, ever ask a question where the option of the answer is no. So if you want to get into a room, you don't say, hey, can I have that room? Or how much would that room cost? Or I want to, I want to do this uh, thing here tomorrow night. Is it available? You just say, I want to do something in that room. What should we do to make this wonderful? Oh, or, what a I'm great sure you, question. I'm sure you've done something before here. How can we top what you've done before, even if they've never done it before? You know, just ask something that gets them thinking of a response, something that quite simply makes it awkward and almost retarded <laughs> for them to go, no. And you'll go, well, that doesn't make sense because I didn't ask you that question. <laughs> so always ask a question uh, or never ask a question where you don't want the answer. <laughs> Awkward is like my least favorite. I mean, you're from the UK. I feel like UK sense of humor loves awkward. Like, have you ever seen the the UK version of The Office? Well, do you mean the original one? Yeah, the real one. With <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're like you mean the one that the US knocked off? Yes, that's the one. <laughs> I took a, a business ethics class in college, and the professor he was um, I think he was from Scotland. He made us watch that. I yeah. can't even sit through like five minutes of it. It was so awkward. So <laughs> what a great question. You said, what should we do to make this wonderful? How can we top the best thing you've ever done here? And that can be used for anything. That could be used with a business relationship. That could be used with an employee. It could be, it, it could be with a family. It could be with a family member. See, nothing that I do cannot be utilized in any other relationship. All I do is work the best possible way to make the most out of any relationship I've got. And if it's to be borrowing the Vatican for a night or going out with my wife for dinner, how can I make this the best possible experience? How can I make this wonderful? How can I make this a memory you won't forget? Yeah, this is so great. So again, I'm really curious of, of the dynamic in everyday life. So you said something about, you know, I ride bikes, I grill chicken. You made it sound like you're this super simple, easy to please person? Uh, no, I'm simple. I'm not easy to please. Okay. So say more about that. What, like, what does it take to, what do you, 
Ah, how do I? I don't, se- I don't settle. I'm I don't a little settle. kid. I, I won't settle. So you know, if I'm buying chicken, I'm going to a damn good place. I'm buying the best chicken that looks beautiful. If the chicken looks a bit ropey, I'll walk away from the chicken. So I just don't settle. And so, for people who might feel like they don't have time for that, what, what do you? How can you not have time for that? How can you possibly chick? We, we are getting older just during, through this podcast. How the fuck can you sell for something <laughs> that doesn't make your life better? If you are settling, get off this podcast now. Um, <laughs> no, you, should, you shouldn't be listening to this. If you're the, if you're the settler, you should never have even tuned into this. Uh, so I want to I wanna go back to relationship for a minute because you said something about always passion, always passion, always passion. So you said you've been with your wife for how many years? Uh, all of them. Um, them. Yeah, apparently we went to the same school when we were right little kids. No way. Uh, so we've often wondered, you know, if the websites and cameras had been around them days, I wonder if we'd have seen ourselves, me probably chasing her around the playground. That's but, hilarious. Um, yeah, and then she moved away for, to a local village, and uh, I moved into that village a little bit later on in my teens. And uh, we, we hooked up, and we've been together forever. So forever. How do you keep passion in a relationship then? I love... Well, she, she's phenomenal. Um <sighs> You know, she's everything. She she grows. She she never she never she never meets my expectations. She's just constantly exceeding uh, what I'm looking for. And those moments when when life gets you, and we're entrepreneurs, so we're always getting fucked. We're always getting screwed over. Everything's going wrong. Everything's against us. Everything in the world is against entrepreneurs. Yet it's the it's the route that we take. Um, and sometimes it gets a little bit heavy on your shoulders. And you just get a moment where you just want to sit in a corner. And that's the moment when she just comes over and puts her hand on my shoulder and I know everything's going to be fine. I love that. Say more. We get a lot of entrepreneurs listen to the show. What do you mean by everything? We live in a world where everything is against entrepreneurs. Well, um, have you ever heard the old story about um, we've all got crabs? No. Um, haven't you heard it? Well, the, it? Crabs. Crabs are a very selfish bunch of bastards. I think it's because they're so yeah. ugly. Um, if you stick a pile of crabs in a bucket, and this is a true story, and there's been loads of conversations about it, you stick a lot of crabs in the, in the bucket, and they will all try to reach up for the top. And then sooner or later, one of them will grab the top and start to hoist him out. Now, all the crabs will grab that crab, not to climb up on his back and get out, but to actually pull him out, because no crab's allowed to gain over any other crab. And there's a lot of people in our life, and corporations, and taxation, and education systems, and red tape, and just arseholes that have somehow had the job that are sitting in front of you saying no, that are those crabs. That don't actually want you getting any further, because hey, you can't get out there. You can't have fun, because I don't. And those are the crabs in your life that try to hold you back. And so you've got to be aware that they exist, because when you know they exist, you can avoid them or step over them. Yeah. And we've all got them. And the trouble is, it's only those closest to you that can get the tightest grip. So yes, those crabs, yes. those crabs are not on the other side of the world. Those crabs are next door to you. Those crabs may be in your life. Those crabs may be in your relationship. Those crabs may be in your family. And every now and then you've got to realize it and go, look, I love you, but fuck being you're a crab. And <laughs> I can't be dealing with you at the moment. Yeah, yeah, it's great. So we talk about boundaries here a lot. That's just, I, I get it. Real quick, taking a pause from the episode to bring you a note from one of our sponsors. If you love listening to the podcast, you might also love listening to audiobooks. Audiobooks is something I just got into three or four years ago. Uh, They're perfect for the car, road trips, long commutes, walking the dog. Uh, Sometimes we just don't have time to sit down and read a book, or sometimes we want to digest a book that we've already read in a different way. Some of my, my favorite, favorite books, I have both the print copies and the audio copies so I can listen and I can reflect and and every time I go back and I listen I always catch something different or something always lands with me differently and I'm super excited to have the audio version of my book Untame Yourself in the works and it'll be coming out later this spring 2016 depending on when you're listening to this it might already be up but check out audibletrial.com forward slash Elizabeth and when you go there using that special link, you can actually get a free trial. So you can download an audiobook for free to see if you like listening to audiobooks or, or maybe you already have listened to audiobooks before and, and why not just check it out to get one for free that you've been really thinking about getting. So it's audibletrial.com 
forward slash Elizabeth to get yourself a free audio book. And that's it. Back to the show. Um, this question, these lines of questions where, where you don't ask questions that the answer could be yes or no. Um, how has that served you with kids? Um, well, they're the greatest salespeople in the world. <laughs> and uh, it's great. What I've tried to do is not to give my kids the, uh, the tick box mentality. So when they come home and they got that grade, oh, great, hoorah, you know, that's your grade. But how does it impact you? And you want to start asking those questions so they start to realize the accountability. What do you think this is going to do for your future now that you've just got to see here? You know, so do you think this and, and you ask some questions, you get them asking themselves why you get them thinking outside of the box. You don't want them to settle. So you want them to go, well, OK, the thing that bothers me is my, my daughter's 17 years old and she's being asked, you know, OK, you have to go to college next year. You know, what do you want to be for the rest of your life? Right. Fuck knows what I want for dinner tonight. How can you ask a 17 year old what they're going to be for the rest of their life? Yeah. And I was a builder and now I'm rolling around with the Pope. Next week, I'm doing a party with Elton John. So no way in the world I was at college going, I think I want to work with the Vatican. Uh-huh. You know, you just don't do that. So I find it really remarkable that we ask our kids that now. So I want them to be in, in the situation where they question everything. And you've got to be strong enough to be able to accept an answer that you may not agree with. Yeah. You want your kids to be better than you. You absolutely do. If you want your kids to grow up to be the same, of, same as you, I say it loud and proud, you're a failed parent. Your job is to allow them to miss out on as many scars and, and smacks as possible. Now, they're going to make their own. They're going to make different ones. But you love your kids. You want them to be a bit better than you. I pray. I, two of my kids are old enough already that they're way better than me. And the other one's 11, and he's probably just knocking on it already. <laughs> so I want all three of them to exceed their father and, and, and my wife. Um, in your opinion, what does that mean, better than you? What about them makes them better than you? Confidence to fall down. Um, strength in their relationships, their conviction, their honesty, their integrity. If they say they're going to do it, they do it. So I want them to have the basic ground rules of quite simply a Victorian society. I want them to have that kind of mentality where your word is your bond. Yeah, you can have a 50-page contra- contract, but if someone's going to screw you, they're going to screw you regardless of what piece of paper they sign. But if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. And if you say you're going to do something, you're going to do it. I have a question for you. What you're like, of course you do. It's you're interviewing me. Um, <laughs> I do think that. <laughs> Well, which actually is a perfect segue because I had a feeling. What is your relationship, if any, to your intuition? Or your instincts, however it is that you relate to that as a man. Again, you love asking questions. It's got like about three elements in it. I know. Um, I do. My intuition, my instinct are the same thing for yeah. a start. I don't understand why they're different between a male and a female, okay, or a man and a woman. I don't understand why my instincts as a man make any difference to whether or not they be the instincts to a woman. If something gets your gut fluttering, it's either for good or bad. Trust it, okay? Um, you've heard of the reptilian brain. You walk past a bush, you hear, you hear a rustle, and you, you do that, and that instant second, you've got a fight-or-flight reaction. That's what the reptilian brain is in the front. And that's what you should have in everything. If you meet someone and you get a funny feeling from it, then trust that feeling. OK, um, and just stick with it. So my, my instincts, I rule life with my instincts. I love it. Well, and you didn't really ask the question, but the difference, it's just really interesting to hear you say that, like, it's so black and white. What do you mean? You have a feeling, you follow the feeling, you just trust it. Like, yeah. I have to teach people how to do that because in so many ways, our culture teaches people not to trust that and places well, that's, the authority the outside thing. of them. Yeah, that's the kiddie thing again. Yes, it is. We're, we're, we're taught, we're taught to, 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 to dilute our feelings, to dilute yeah. our reactions. Yeah. And, and the words and little statements like, think twice before you speak, you right. know, and, <laughs> you know, think about, I can't, no, if, if you pick up a bowl, uh, a bowl of water and it's hot, 
is that kid going to pick it up again? <laughs> you know, you learn things. So what you're teaching people is to basically unteach them what they yes. learn as of the age of three. That's exactly. It's, it's, I call it uh, unlearning, deprogramming, and, and it's remembering, right? Because it's not new. You already knew yep. how to do that. Yep, absolutely. You already knew this shit, but you colored it along the way or you covered it. And so, I mean, so we, you went to school, you grew up like that. How did you come back or how did you get to the place where you're like, no, like I have a feeling I follow it. I trust it. Was there any, anything? Yeah, there was, I, I didn't realize. And I told you before about my story about the parties with the delusion that I was going to go into a bank. Yeah. So I was doing all of this for fun and frolics. Okay. Because this was my end goal over here. So here, I just had fun with it. Uh And here, I would put on a suit and be someone completely different. When I suddenly started becoming successful, I thought, hang on, people better take me seriously. They're not going to take me seriously if I look like this. So I started buying suits. And I bought expensive watches. I actually had Porsches, Ferraris, and Bentleys because I thought people are taking me seriously. And I would pull up like this, and I'd be like, hi, how are you? I'm Steve. Uh And the trouble is... When you're not you, yep. you cause the other person to have that gut reaction. And if there's slight mistrust, that's when they go, hmm, is that person good, bad? Because something's not right here. Yep. And that's the vibe I was giving off. Because I was turning up and I wasn't being me. I was being the perception of what I wanted you to see. My income started going down. The business I got started going down. And we were like, what the hell is it? And I, I, I remember this. I thought to myself, I've always been to this, this bar. I've always been to this restaurant. I used to do well. I go there now. I do shit. I'm going to go back there, and I'm just going to sit on the corner of the bar, and I'm going to watch. Because I thought in my head, maybe the people have changed. So I'm going to go and observe. So I pulled up on my motorbike, walked on in there, stuck the helmet on the bar, ordered a whiskey, sat there, watched the world. I've now just gone in as me. All of a sudden, I started chatting to people and I moved away from the bar and everything's going well. And then I realized the people hadn't moved away from me. I'd moved away from the people. Yeah. So from that on, uh, I actually went, right, that's it. I'm back. I sold the cars. <laughs> I just collected the bikes, I ride around on bikes, turn up like this, love it, leave it, whatever. You're not going to be confused with what you get. Yeah, and there's that that extra energy expenditure, right? Of having to like be something you're not, be uncomfortable That's in the clothes, it. put up the front, have the stuff you didn't want anyway. Well, that's what we, we touched on that earlier. And when I've done consulting, people have said, oh, yeah, I want to I wanna build a unique brand. And I said, well, then you've got to stop doing what you're doing now because everybody's unique and you take up a load of effort to be somebody you're not and then you can't utilize that effort for anything else because you've already wasted it on being superficially you. So if you take that out of the way, all of your effort can be on a project, a loved one, a relationship, anything else because being you takes zero effort. Zero effort. Oh, my God, this is great. And that's actually, like, that is what happened for me as well. In 2013, I finally stopped, like, trying to do what all the people were telling me to do. And I'm like, ah, I'm just going to be myself. And then all of a sudden, making money was the easiest thing in the world. And when you go back to those people and you look at them again and you see that they're all going to work at nine o'clock and they're coming home at five o'clock and they're all driving their like four GTX YZ because it's always got those little sport initials at the back, you know, and they're the crabs because they're all doing the exact same thing and you try to break out and they were the naysayers. Yeah, well, it's even for me, they weren't even naysayers, but it was just like in this entrepreneur space of like the Internet of people being like, use my formula, do it my way. That certainly works for some people, but it just wasn't working for me. That's fine. That's fine. But it's good. I have a lot of people to sell those programs. We both know a lot of those people. Yes, yes, yes. Two things happen. One of those things is it's a great way for you to get started, but it's also a great way for you to learn how to put you into that program. The yeah. program isn't the answer. The program is the stepping ladder yeah. to get to be in you. And you may find halfway through it that if I did this, 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 I can multiply it. But if you hadn't been on the runs of that ladder in the first place, then you wouldn't be able to get to that realization. So yeah, yeah. it's a good discovery tool. It's actually uh, Lisa Berkovitz. I don't know if you met her at Archangel. She was the interview before yours last week. And we said different way, but said the same thing. Sometimes you have to start down one path so you can get a few steps in and be like, oh, and then pivot. But you couldn't have gotten in the right way if you hadn't started down that one that wrong or whatever. 
what was it? It was Edison that said he found a thousand ways not to build a light bulb. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So you know, it's all it's always those kind of things. You know, I'm a great I'm a great fan of uh, failure is the best education in the planet. Totally. Um, and I've learned I've learned millions of dollars worth of ways of not doing stuff. So <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, don't be don't be frightened to fail. Don't be frightened to fall off. My dad, um, my dad wasn't this mystical, uh, mystical wizard or anything like that, but as this big, thick, massive Irishman would turn around and he said to me, usually from about this angle, he would say to me, no one ever died, fall, uh, no one ever drowned falling in the water. They drowned by staying there. Um. So I was like, <laughs> okay, Dad. So, <laughs> and of course, like when you're nine years old and you've got this bloody great Paddy staring at you, telling you that, you're kind of like, <laughs> what the hell does that mean? You know? <laughs> so then as you get older, you go, yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying now. Oh, amazing. So I don't know that my particular audience, maybe, you never know, uh, if anyone wants an experience, they want to contact you, they want to find you. <laughs> they it... turned off half hour ago. No, they didn't. I bet they're, <laughs> I can't wait. I actually can't wait. Um, <laughs> I love, I mean, this was on purpose. I was thinking about who can I bring in? Well, and you even said this earlier. It's a pattern interrupt. It's so different from what we're used to, but it's so great and it's so unapologetically you. Yep, easy. And and whether they agree or not doesn't matter, but just to be in the energy of someone who doesn't give a shit and will just be themselves, that is a gift. So thank you very much. Um, Brilliant. Your website, it's Bluefish? Uh, I've got two. I've got thebluefish.com, which is all the weird and wacky stuff that I get up to. Uh, and then I've got Ugly Sims, which is where I rant about what I think about in the world. And it's all my, uh, my opinions and my... Uh, my, my vomiting of, of uh, abuse and stuff like that. So uglysims.com <laughs> is my personal rant space and thebluefish.com is all the adventures I get up to. Listen, sometimes we need a little ranting in our lives. Too. Damn right, damn right. Thank you so, so much. Uh, it took us uh, three times to get the recording to work and it was well <laughs> worth it. Technology always works when you need it to. So thank you so, right. so much. We'll see you later. Bye. And what I've discovered so far is when the masculine and the feminine are in balance in the way you're doing, and again, like you said, apply this to other areas of your life if it's not business for you. Yeah. But in the context of business, I ensure that I create spaciousness every single day so that I can hear what my next step is. And once I've received that, which is the feminine or the soul in the lead, then I know what to do and I engage my masculine to get it done. Yes. There's effort to get it done. There's effort. But there's not struggle. There's not exhaustion. There's not overexertion. There's yeah. not control and trying and all those other words that, you know, are born out of this sense that, you know, the I've got to get it done and putting the masculine first.